Welcome. My name is David Mears. I'm the Executive Director of Audubon, Vermont. Thank you for joining us for our conversation tonight in our webinar, a tough conversation about climate in the age of COVID. And uh, super excited to have a group of amazing panelists uh, joining us. You'll get to meet them in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to remind folks who hadn't already uh, participated in one of these webinars that Audubon is kind of elevating, looking to young people, youth leaders, conservation leaders who are the next generation to help us understand and engage in some of the toughest issues that are facing our country and our globe. And for the moment, uh, the uh, COVID-19 is occupying a lot of our attention. And so uh, it provides some interesting lessons and, and ways to think about how we respond to the climate crisis as well. So we're excited to have assembled a group of folks that are going to be able to tackle this set of issues from the perspective of people that are gonna be working for the rest of their careers to try to address this mess that we've made. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna turn things over to Mariah Herod, who is uh, along with Lawrence Saylor, one of two interns, policy interns working with Audubon Vermont, and who put together this panel and assembled this amazing group and a set of questions that will challenge them and then you'll have a chance to ask questions as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Mariah. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Audubon Vermont's webinar on climate in the age of COVID-19. My name is Mariah Herod, and I'm a policy research intern with Audubon Vermont. Thank you guys for joining us. Tonight, I'm gonna to be facilitating a, a conversation among climate activists, emerging professionals on taking action in a pandemic, seeing the connection between these crises and having effective conversations about that connection. We were inspired to host this forum because we recognize that climate change is complicated and it's only becoming more complicated with all the challenges of COVID-19. So this webinar really is aiming to uplift the stories of climate activists struggling with these dual pandemics, open a conversation on how we might each more effectively take action and bring us all together as we universally struggle with these crises. Now, I want to very briefly bring these issues home as many of our viewers are in Vermont, so if we can have the, the COVID slide. So the World Health Organization defines COVID-19 as the disease caused by the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, short for Coronavirus Disease 2019. According to the Vermont Department of Public Health, there are about 1,500 confirmed cases of COVID in the states. So our state has relatively successfully protected the health of its citizens, but the overall state of affairs continues to affect, I think, everybody's well-being, especially when paired with the climate crisis. Um, so next slide. Regarding climate change in Vermont, the Vermont Department of Public Health has reported that spring is now arriving two weeks earlier and winter is starting one week later compared to 1960. Air temperature in Vermont has increased more than four degrees Fahrenheit in winter and two degrees Fahrenheit in summer. And annual precipitation in Vermont has increased by almost seven inches compared to 50 years ago. By the end of the century, Vermont climate scientists expect that the frost free season will grow by several weeks with more rain and less snow in winter. Days above 87 degrees Fahrenheit will increase from about six per year to more than 20 per year. And extreme precipitation events, which are ones that have more than three inches of rain, will increase in frequency from once every seven years to about every two to three years. Um, lastly, Audubon has a really great resource that I'm about to link in the chat that shows what bird species in your area are at risk from climate change. I'm gonna link that real quick. right there and we can go to the next slide and the last slide one more okay keeping in mind that we want this webinar to be both catalyzing and comforting i'm going to hand this off to lauren who's the other policy research intern so that she can introduce our speakers and begin the questions thank you mariah uh so my name is lauren sailor i use she her pronouns I'm also a policy research intern at Audubon, Vermont. I will be moderating and I'll be posing the questions to the panel tonight. Uh, I want to invite the speakers individually now to introduce themselves. Um, could you please give your pronouns, uh, give a little bit about your background, 
remember to name yourself and give us your favorite bird. So with that, uh, Marcelo, could you take us away? Hello and good night, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Marcelo Diaz, pronounced he, him, his. I am actually a Brazilian environmental attorney uh, with an expertise in international environmental law and also substantial professional experience across public, private, and international sectors. I have professional and academic experience in Brazil and also in the United States. And I earned a master's of policy in environmental law at the Vermont Law School. Uh, and while I was in the US, I worked for the CIEL, Center for International Environmental Law in Washington, DC, the Vermont River Conservancy in Montpelier, and also uh, with Audubon Vermont and the National Audubon Office uh, in Washington, DC in the international segment. Uh, and also worked as a community and forest and land conservation specialist at the Jerry Gunder Hill Land Trust in Vermont. My favorite bird is definitely the hummingbird. I love hummingbirds too. I love watching them at my family's farm. I'll be going there soon. Great. Uh, Emily, could you take it away? Sure, my name is Emily Anderson. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have a background in environmental science from the University of Maine and a master's degree in environmental law and policy from Vermont Law School. Um, and I'm really interested in how storytelling can be used to impact environmental issues and raise awareness and inspire change. And at the moment, I'd have to say my favorite bird is a barred owl um, because the property I just moved from had a nesting pair there and I used to love to see them hunting in our yard every day and kind of missing that. So I'd say those are my favorite. I think we can all relate to observing birds and seeing pairs. Uh, let's see who's next, Kaylee. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee Dillon. I use she, her pronouns. I am a rising senior at the University of Vermont studying wildlife biology, and I am also the new president of the newly founded Audubon UVM chapter. So we're a collegiate a collegiate branch and we are hoping to advance the National Audubon Society's mission. I'm really excited about it just for the opportunity to engage more people in environmental issues and specifically related to birds in general. Um, from my personal perspective, I am particularly interested in bird conservation and I'm lucky enough that I've already had a couple experiences doing research with threatened and other species of conservation concern. Um, I'm currently working on olive-sided flycatchers in the Northeast. Um, so I am really excited to be here tonight. And my favorite bird is the ruby-crowned kinglet. Thanks, Kaylee. I've actually done research too. I love that. Maybe you could send that to me after um, you're done. Yeah, totally. Uh, Maya? Um, I'm going to be, uh, my name's Maya. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm a rising junior at Harwood Union High School near Montpelier, Vermont. And I'm part of the Vermont Youth Lobby, which is a group of youth activists, mostly high school students, working um, in the State House and finding other ways to make climate action in Vermont. And um, I'm really excited to be here. My favorite bird is the black cap chickadee. Thanks, Maya. So, Dan, could you bring up the uh, questions? Thanks. So now for the webinar, uh, we're going to be going through questions one by one. Uh, each of the panelists will be reflecting on these questions, maybe one, maybe a few. Uh, and we're just going to have a conversation. Uh, so we hope you're all ready to listen. So as for question number one, as an environmentalist in the age of COVID-19, how has the pandemic affected your ability to apply yourself to your work? Has it affected your ability to get outside and stay motivated? So first we have Emily. Sure, so I would say the main way that COVID has affected my current um, my current role is that I, a lot of what I was doing was in-person programming and education. Um, and obviously it's difficult to do that when you're trying to socially distance, you can't meet in, 
confined rooms, you have to be outside. And um, especially back in March, this was really challenging. So I had to try to find new ways to connect with the same audiences that I was hoping to work with. Um, and thankfully, we live in the age of the internet. And a lot of my webinars became, or my uh, workshops became Zoom based webinars, uh, which was a learning curve. It's very challenging to go from speaking to an audience that you can see and interact with to suddenly talking to what feels like just yourself and your computer because you can't see anyone, you can't hear anyone, and it feels very disorienting. Um, so I would say that's the biggest way it changed as far as being able to get outside. Um, thankfully, uh, Due to Vermont being able to keep the number of cases low, we've been able to resume some field work as long as it's done um, in a safe way. Uh, so, so in that way, I've been lucky that I've been able to get back outside more. Uh, but it's definitely been discouraging to see both um, kind of the lack of uh, cohesive action as as a nation that's felt a little discouraging. But it's also been really hopeful um, as an environmentalist seeing everyone come together for individual action. I know it can seem at times like that's not happening as well as we might hope, but um, so much of the good things that have happened have been dri driven by individual or local action that it makes me really hopeful for um, how we might be able to start tackling climate change in a more, in a stronger way. Thanks, Emily. I really loved your message on hope. Uh, Maya, do you want to add to that? Um, I would say, for me, um, I my schedule really freed up when school ended for me um, in person. So our all of our meetings have been able to happen more freely. And for the first time, the youth lobby is meeting during the summer. Um, so we've had a lot more time and a lot more people around to get some work done. Um, usually people are away during the summer in high school. So um, we've had an opportunity to get a lot more work done. Um, because of everyone being around. And we've found a lot of outdoor spaces to have meetings, but that's, I think the biggest challenge for us is um, we have groups of people from around the state. So getting everyone in one outdoor space with Wi-Fi to get together has been a challenge. Um, and we're looking forward to harnessing new, like social media activism in the coming months because a lot of people are at home and that's a way that we can uh, outreach to people other than our rallies that aren't happening right now. Um, but we are, we focus a lot on education as well. So I think like Emily was saying, we can't in the classroom as much helping people understand these issues. It's really frustrating and we have to do whatever we can to try to make things work as environmentalists. And I'm really interested in your work at the youth lobby. Um, could you maybe share a little bit more about what you do? Um, so I'm a newer member as of this year, but a lot of, we have different groups of people doing different things. We mainly focus on climate this year. We're gonna be doing a few more um, areas of activism. And we have lobbyists that go into the state house and they work with lawmakers to push climate bills and um, really take a lot of action, uh, respective, respectful action. And we also organize a rally every year in April at the State House, which wasn't able to happen this year. Um, so really just trying to get youth involved in as many ways possible, like on the governmental level, um, more than just like in school clubs and stuff. That's really great. It's inspiring. I'm new to lobbying myself. <laughs> Jacob, do you want to add any thoughts to that? Jacob, do you want to add on? You're muted, Jacob. Yeah, so um, obviously I didn't introduce myself before, but um, yeah, my name is Jacob. I'm um, currently uh, doing this from Melbourne, um, right in the middle of Melbourne, actually. And I suppose with restrictions, it's quite scary. Uh, there's like no one in the streets at the moment, so um, quite interesting. Um, but um, I think due to restrictions in Melbourne, the last four months, it's been incredibly difficult to find the motivation to sort of take further action. Um, 
I think this is just because of the unpredictability of the um, current circumstances. Um, we're finding it hard to plan our next moves because we can't establish a relevant timeline of events. Um, but fortunately, like I've taken this time to sort of self-reflect on what it is I want to I want to do to to affect change. Um, I recently just got um, given an opportunity to be on the Australian Canadian First Nations Youth Health Committee, um, which is really cool. And so that's going to like offer me an opportunity to sort of help um, develop policy and and stuff that's going to um, hopefully close the gap between Indigenous health in both Australia and Canada. So very exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. Marcella, do you want to add on to Jacob? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I shall confess to the audience that this pandemic is teaching me lessons in a daily basis. I think no one ex was expecting and, uh, what you're actually living these days. And well, uh, even to give more additional value to the clean air that we breathe and feel in our lungs, I'm starting to actually uh, pay more attention to that. Things that I didn't imagine seeing myself in a couple of months ago doing. And this is being nice uh, in terms of uh, personal growing. However, I understand that this pandemic has impacted everyone's life in a different way. Uh, well, being here in Brazil is totally different from being in Australia, as Jacob is right now, and totally different from being in Vermont. So uh, I think that people organize depending on their econom economic circumstances, uh, their geographic location, and also how the environment is being conserved in the areas where they live. This has a crucial role towards uh, mitigating the impacts of this pandemic. However, I also understand that it's crystal clear that this situation is an extraordinary and temporary situation. The epidemic has been unfortunately wrecking huge havoc in human life and our well-being. So uh, one can quickly realize how important the environmental stewardship can enhance our society's quality of life, quality of living. So notably, the pandemic has been serving as a boost to extend my voice on things that matter, such as the integrity of our environment's quality and how we can make a substantial contribution towards human health. So in this regard, I understand that this COVID situation has allowed myself to keep fighting for things that make an impact on human life positively. The fight, the fight against climate change and the favoring of a low carbon economy, economy is amongst them. And I'm developing some actions in that regard here in Brazil and also globally. I love your thoughts on how we all have to work. We just have to get our hands in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go to question two. Thank you, Dan. So as for question two, have you felt that you've made a difference while responding to multiple crises? And as for who's going to go first, Marcelo, take it away again. Well, yeah, so uh, hard times, right? You have to adapt yourself. Uh, so while at the middle of the COVID crisis, I really try to my fullest capacity to always keep the light of hope shining bright. Uh, I try to be thankful for every moment and for every experience I was undergoing and also take advantage of things that uh, I couldn't be doing if I was not uh, uh, present at a different geographic location as we are doing right now. So I try to connect to people, to put people aware and actually boost people to extend their voice towards uh, the implementations of better environmental stewardship guidelines. So uh, I knew that also this pandemic came to give us a strong alert uh, to take, among other things, environmental stewardship and conservation more seriously. Therefore, uh, I also knew that climate change was among these top priorities. And in this context, I decided to start here in Brazil for the first time the constitution with the support uh, from other folks of a decarbonization institute aimed at building bridges with government and civil society 
towards shaping and implementing low carbon policies here in Brazil and Latin America. And you are all invited to, do, to join this future institute we're doing here in Brazil. I can, I'm happy to provide more and additional details once we have a project set up. And right now we are actually gathering strong support from academia, civil society and NGOs. The idea basically is to fight against the detrimental consequence of climate change here in Brazil and definitely global because I understand climate change is a problem that is here and affect our quality of living regardless of where we are. So uh, this is exactly what I tried to do and respond to multiple crises during this COVID times we're living. You're absolutely right. Climate change affects all of us. Yeah. Jacob, do you have anything to add? You're muted, Jacob. Sorry about that. <laughs> so if I'm being completely honest, um, I was yeah, heavily impact, in, impacted by this. Um, it just completely shakes your moral compass, oh, just your compass in general, I think. Initially, I found it hard to sort of ground myself and keep moving in the direction of what, you know, is important to me, which is closing the gap between Indigenous health and health outcomes globally. However, with my work with Indigenous people in Australia, I found mediums to share knowledge of how environmental destruction directly impacts on their well-being. Um, this is intrinsic awareness to a lot of my clients. Um, as I said, I'm an Indigenous youth worker and a lot of these young people come from really disadvantaged backgrounds who don't get the opportunity you know, to go to university or don't have that knowledge shared firsthand. Um, but I have been able to convey the theoretical understanding um, that so many of us have been fortunate to you know, encounter in academic and peer settings. And so I've actually just found different ways to sort of provide that information to them. So we're not doing one-on-one um, -on -one or, or, or group things at the moment, but I've been um, on, I've been making lots of presentations and PowerPoints and, I've been incorporating the importance of um, environmental um, sustainability with, within, um, to, you know, to, to influence broader health outcomes, um, which is like obviously like so cool because like a lot of these young people like they're you know they're from quite disadvantaged backgrounds and um, it's climate change has been affecting their community their communities for you know the last 50, 60 years and and they are aware of it and they, and, and and some of them just can't um, put into words why it's happening. And so I've been able to yeah, convey that theoretical knowledge as to why, you know, as to why it's happening. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, that's the change I've been, you know, trying to make and that's how I've been adapting to the whole situation. Does anyone else have any thoughts they'd like to add on this question? Otherwise we can move to question three. Dan, let's go to question three. Are there parallels between the challenges of COVID-19 and climate change? And how can we help people see the connection? First, we have Emily for this question. Take it away. Great. Yeah, so there are a lot of par parallels, um, but I'm going to talk about two main ones um, just because I know there are other people who will also answer this question. Um, so the first one I want to just touch on briefly is um, the politicization of science. I think we've all kind of become aware over the last year, um, especially like how bad this has gotten. There are deep divides in our country in general, um, but trust of science has really come under um, some uncertainty recently, as well as uh, the role that science plays in shaping people's worldviews. Um, and then just questions about how science is taught in general, because I know um, when COVID was beginning, at first we were all told that um, you, you, we should be sparing with our mask use because we want to save it for um, doctors and nurses and other frontline workers who really need it. Um, and it was unclear how much of a role this would play in preventing the spread of COVID. Um, but then as more evidence came out saying that masks are really a crucial part of the strategy, um, suddenly the scientists' recommendations changed. And I, I personally worry that sometimes, at least from my own experience, um, in science um, in grade school and in high school, science is sometimes taught as this thing that's made up of facts and permanent information instead of this fluid piece of work that's going to change and grow and evolve over time as we learn more. Um, so I think some of the mistrust comes from this fact that science is always shifting um, and that being at odds with the, what we're taught that, that 
the earth is a certain way, that the weather moves a certain way, that um, things in science behave a certain way, when in reality we're always learning and this is always changing. Um, and so this uncertainty that people have is right now getting weaponized in a lot of ways um, to create more uncertainty and make it easier for people to push their own agendas based on um, where their interests lie. Um, and I think this is coming through both in climate change. We've seen big players cover up information that would indicate um, how bad the effects of climate change were decades ago. And we've seen this with COVID with a lot of misinformation that gets shared. And the internet definitely makes this a lot easier um, because it's easier to get misinformation validated as well. Um, so that's one part of it. The other part of it um, is our approach to how we're dealing with these problems. And the way I feel about it is that we've been very reactionary instead of proactive. Um, so for COVID, for instance, um, because the hospitalizations lag infections, we're seeing this delayed response in people who are getting infected. Um, and so this delayed metric of how bad the problem is, and we wait to respond until the number of cases is skyrocketing, but the problem is those infections were already happening weeks ago. And it's a similar thing with climate change where we're not, we're still, we're beginning to see some of the problems arise from the warming that's occurring from land degradation. Um, but we're still not reacting fast enough. And I worry that we're going to run into a similar problem where we wait until we're seeing the consequences of what's already been occurring before we choose to act. Um, and the thing is, COVID, it's a terrible situation. It's catastrophic. It's killed way more people um, than I ever imagined. And it's, it's horrible. But the thing is, is that in our lifetime, COVID isn't permanent. Climate change will be permanent in effectively in our lifetime. Um, so it's something that we need to start addressing before we start seeing the, some of the effects that have been predicted. Um, and I believe was the last part of the question, just how you would talk to someone about um, the connections between COVID and uh, climate change, I think, yeah. Um, so just to briefly touch on this, I mean, I guess how I usually like to think about it is approaching it not as a debate, because I know that um, it can be really tempting when you're trying to convince someone of something, anything, whether it's climate change or COVID or, I, just anything in your life, uh, it can be really tempting to just give people all the facts and say, here are the facts. Why don't you understand why these facts are true? Um, the problem is, is if the facts contradict what people's own lived experiences are, by just shouting facts at someone, you can actually drive them farther back away from seeing your side of things. So the best approach is actually to engage a conversation with them. I was listening to a podcast recently and the way they were talking about going about it is asking someone, you know, what, like with COVID, like, why do you think, like, why do you think this has happened? Or um, the, like the, the connection between COVID and climate change, asking how they think COVID got started and just understanding where people are coming from and trying to meet them where they are, give some information. Um, but mostly just try to understand their thoughts and their viewpoint and then just walk away. Because oftentimes people are going to make those, those shifts in understanding a lot faster um, and more sustainably if they're allowed time to think about it for themselves instead of just feeling like they have to be convinced on the spot. It can, I don't know, make people feel self-conscious and they're less likely to wanna to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, that was great. Um, something that I wanted to add based on what you're saying is people and not all people, but people have a mentality of if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. And this applies to climate change and it applies to COVID and it also applies to mental health. And we all have to be aware that we have to take care of ourselves in these crises. Um, and this is getting to the end a bit, but uh, we will be posting resources as a follow up on how to take care of your mental health in the age of COVID-19. Um, so getting back to the panelists, um, let's turn to Kaylee. Hi, 
Hi, yeah, I really wanted to build on one of the points that Emily had made specifically talking about this idea that we've been more reactive than proactive in the case of both of these crises. Um, and it's much easier to head off a crisis near the beginning before you have that spread like you've had with COVID or in the case of climate change before you've had some of these major changes start to occur, you've had emissions pile up. It's exceptionally complicated, obviously. Um, but in both cases, I think we have kind of let some of this early window of opportunity pass us. And we're now in this reactive phase where we're trying to figure out what we can do. And there's this need for a more urgent action. Um, and in a lot of cases, that has been collective action. I think in COVID, we've seen some things that are disheartening and some things that are very heartening, places where either there has been conflict and misinformation and politicization of the issues that has kind of caused this infighting. But we've also have seen people pull together. We have seen positive change. And I think that that's something that we hope to see for climate change into the future. Um, I think what you said, Lauren, about how we can see the impacts of something is also a big factor here. That with COVID, we did have the slag, and now we are immediately seeing some of the impacts in a really terrible way. Um, I think for climate change, especially for those of us who are in a more privileged position, we're not necessarily seeing the impact immediately or as quickly as we would with COVID. Um, and I think one of the reasons you see a lot of younger people stepping up is that we do know this is something we're going to end up living with. So how do you get people to engage with this, to recognize what those long-term impacts would be, and to come together for what can be major changes. Um, for example, in the case of COVID, you are seeing people asked to make big changes to their life. Don't get together with other people, wear a mask if you go outside. And those are big asks for some people and they're stepping back from it. I think that we kind of see a similar hesitation with asking people to take action on climate change. And we need to figure out how to bridge that gap. Um, I think I agree with Emily in a lot of ways as well on that we really do need to be engaging in conversations. Um, I was born and raised in rural Pennsylvania, and I've had discussions with people with a huge variety of different views on some of these issues. And if you just dig your heels in and just tell them that you're right and try and go at it with just facts, then you have people who just step back from each other and dig into their corners and don't want to engage. And I think there is a real need to empathize with other people's concerns, to listen to where they're coming from, and to try to have a productive conversation that takes all of that into account, because that can help them understand where you're coming from and also maybe help you understand what the flaws in your own views could be and where you can improve as well. And that can lead to more effective collective action now that we really, really do need it. Thank you, Kaylee. Yeah, we're, the privileged aren't necessarily seeing these things happen uh, in terms of climate change. Uh, and we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep our privilege in check. Uh, Jacob, would you like to add on? Remember to unmute. I swear to God. Um, yeah, well, I think all, all, all those points were very sound. I definitely agree with them because um, in reality, like, you know, um, it's, it's, it's the people from, from, you know, from l less privileged backgrounds that are, you know, that, that, that are being impacted right now. And that, and, and that, that that's going to you know, be further exasperated by the onset of climate change. Um, one thing I have noticed is, and I, th I think you said it was that with climate change, it seems to be almost very tribal. Um, I think the way that some people conduct themselves in this space is, almost offensive and that's as someone who's an environmental activist but um like for example like I, I wouldn't name any organizations but there's there's young people in privileged positions who are willing to go out there to get arrested for the sake of a cause but they don't realize that this just bringing attention to the people that actually are affected by the issue and so i think that we need to almost take a step back and just realize our own discrepancies and realize where you know um where um yeah, we just need to sort of take a step back and just look at how we are yeah, conducting ourselves in the space, um, I think, because I think that by almost being too offensive and, and, and by presenting it with just hard facts, it turns a lot of people off um, and then they just don't want to engage at all. So you just got to navigate that space. Good rule of life is be kind. That's it, yeah. Uh, at this point, um We'd like to turn to possibly some audience questions.
I hope you like the graphic. I do. <laughs> um, let's see. Questions in the chat? Yeah, Maya, do you want to start? Yeah, there's one from Annie Boudreau that is, what is something we should all be doing to fight climate change? And anyone can pop in. I would say vote. The primaries are coming up. And, um, and then November is not too far around the corner. I can't personally vote yet, but um, that's definitely a step you can take. And there are a lot of easy resources that are being created for this election that people can simply log on online and um, learn about the candidates in their area and what they stand for. And um, so I think social media and the internet overall is making it a lot easier to decide who you want to vote for and make those decisions in an educated manner. And that can really make a difference. So that's a really important thing that can be done. Does so anyone else want to add on to that question? I can step in a little bit here. Um, I think that there are a lot of small actions we hear about pretty frequently, whether that's carpooling or walking instead of driving or recycling or any other number of small things that we're asked to do day to day to make a climate impact. Um, and I think that it is great to be conscientious of all those things. I think that there are some bigger forces at play too, and I don't want to shove off responsibility to individuals. I think that as a collective, we have a lot of power. I also think that this is a an issue with certain forces that have a much bigger impact than others. So other things that I will advocate for is just being a conscientious consumer, understanding what the impacts of products that you may buy, for example, could have, um, and the impacts that, for example, very large corporations can have. Um, and do what you can personally, but also just be aware that there are these much bigger forces and to advocate to in the forces where you can. Uh, for example, one thing that I'm really happy to be able to share is that UVM has recently announced a divestment plan um, to start pulling money out of fossil fuels. And that's something that student activists on campus have worked on for a long time. And I think that's a great example of people coming together for what's kind of a bigger step than any individual can do on their own. Um, so if that's something that you're comfortable with, that you are passionate about, thank you for everything that you guys have done. Uh, sorry, you can go. No, you go. Sorry. Um, I wanted to point out that, uh, Kaylee, your answer to the last question was talking about the parallels um, with COVID and with climate and how people can wear masks and that changes things. And I think that's uh, another parallel to it is if people take collective action and wearing masks or social distancing, you've seen in Vermont when the community came together and did the right thing to stop the spread, our numbers went down and they didn't ever get very high. And you can see that as well. Like at UVM, the a group of people came together and did something and now UVM's divesting. And it's not gonna happen if individuals don't make that change. So if individuals wear a mask, things are gonna change. If individuals get together and do something, we can do UVM or other things. Exactly. We're going to take one more question from the audience. This one's from Steve. Hi, Steve. Both COVID and climate change are nonpartisan issues, but are too often politicized. Can this be used as an advantage to encourage action? Can I can I give an answer for that? Well, uh, well, I understand that this is a very good question. To be really honest, and. Well, uh, I was just thinking about what the other panelists were addressing. I was imagining myself listening to the same conversation 10 years in the future. Uh, I think that uh, if we had this chance, we're going to see how science it plays a really pivotal role towards tackling the most preeminent uh, things related to climate change and also this COVID situation. So uh, I understand that in this particular science uh, is pretty much more important than what uh, politicians are trying to address. We got to make sure that the politicians that we are possibly voting are connected to this uh, necessities and also this uh, importance that education uh, plays towards developing new and strong mentality 
in the collective towards uh, not only people going for the polls and uh, putting their their votes, casting their ballots, and say I'm going to vote for X or Y, but knowing the reasons why they're going to vote for X and Y. And I think uh, since climate change is one of our hardest things we're living right now in terms of uh, difficulties. I understand that uh, it should be a top priority and pretty much uh, knowing how to actually figure out how politicians uh, are valuing uh, the interconnections between all these issues and the role that science plays in that regard. And I think this is quite important for uh, developing new policies, shaping new uh, technologies, and even creating a more, uh, I would say, more tuned, fine-tuned society with these uh, issues we're living in and how we can possibly in the near future tackle uh, this, this panorama. Anyone else? Do you think that, I'm just pulling up the question again, both COVID and climate change are nonpartisan issues, but are often to politicize or are politicized, excuse me. Can this issue be used as an advantage to encourage action? I'd love to maybe get a snap reflection. Um, if everyone unmutes and says yes or no, I'll give you a count of three. One, two, three. All right, I'll go. Um, I would say yes, if I'm understanding the question properly. So I'll kind of elaborate on that. Um, one thing I think is really interesting as well to take into consideration is that, especially in environmental terms, the politi politicization, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, of environmental issues is more of a recent phenomena. Uh, I'm specifically thinking, for example, of the, some of the major environmental changes of the 1970s, where a lot of those actions were nonpartisan. Um, and this shift towards this highly politicized view on environmental issues and especially climate change is much more recent. Um, and I think that one thing I've actually been very heartened to see more recently is this effort to span the aisle and that taking into account the idea that this is highly politicized and coming into that with a bit of self-criticism in mind and an ability to reflect and not just dig into your own corner um, we've, at least in the circles I've been in, I've started to see people reaching out to try to cross that barrier. And I think that there is a potential future for activism and good policy in bipartisan work. Um, and I know there's some people who would probably push back on me for that. Um, but I, 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 as much as I will advocate go out, vote, get out for people who you think will stand up for what you believe in. I also know that we are not going to get there by brute force. Um, so this ability to reach across and to have a discussion with someone you might not agree with and then use that to come to some conclusion and ideally eventually move away from it being so heavily politicized at all would kind of be my viewpoint on that. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yes. So I just to add to that, just to give you, I suppose, an Australian scope of that. Um, COVID and climate change, it, it is so intrinsically linked to politics, I think, especially with the left and right here. Um, and so I think with, you know, within the scope that I occupy within, um, it's, it's very hard to, to, to take the issue, to address the issue outside of a political scope. Um, and so that's actually some, some, some difficulties that, that, you know, people like myself sort of find um, in the conversations that we have is that it's very hard to do that. It's really hard, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say Audubon believes that conservation doesn't have a party. And uh, that's going off what Kaylee said. Uh, at this point, we want to return back to the regularly scheduled programming. 
<laughs> and we'll go to question four. So question four, could you tell us a story about the, your challenges and successes in having a conversation with someone about climate change? And what about within the context of COVID-19? So take us away, Kaylee. Yeah, this is actually a question I was really excited to address because like I said, I've kind of came from background where the kinds of conversations that I had were really varied. And a lot of times I found that I really just had to start at the beginning, that I couldn't come into any conversation with the assumption of what someone might believe in, what the set of facts that we're working with are, what we can agree on. Um, and that I really needed to listen to what someone else's thoughts were on it, sort of get an idea of where they're coming from and build from wherever that goes. Um, and that gets super, super complex, both socially and politically, because there are so many other issues that are tied in there. One thing I think is interesting in the context of COVID-19 is that prior to COVID, I think it was very easy for people to draw a line in what was possible. Um, and people, there was a set of normal and there's something, some things that were just too far from normal, that they, they weren't feasible. And the conversation would kind of stop there. In this sort of post-COVID world, and I think this is a weird positive for whatever can be said to be positive out of what's happened, is that normal got completely upended. Normal is something else now. And I think that's left this really fascinating space for envisioning what the future looks like. So I've had conversations where I've just sat down with family members around the kitchen table and talked about what life can look like when COVID's over. And to some extent, that means obviously a post-pandemic world, but what can that also mean for an environmental movement? What what is doable now in the context of we know you can get people together to make change we know that there is money there to address crises when we need to use it um and it, it just opens up this realm of possibility that's really exciting to me and has led to some great discussions about broader ideas that aren't as restrained as they could be so that's something that i've been really excited and engaged with and i hope everyone out there is kind of taking some time to think about that too Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, yeah, I agree. We're going to have a new normal after this. And we all have to have open communication with each other, with our peers, everyone, uh, if we want to see a future that we want to have. Uh, as for the next question, Dan. Question number five is, how might we integrate the urgency of climate change into our conservation conversations surrounding COVID-19 and similar crises. Take us away, Marcelo. Well, great. So this is not a very easy question, right? But uh, although not easy, it's not riot, r rocket science as well. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's kind of crystal clear. It turns out that this pandemic has really shown the world how our quality of life has substantially decreased globally within this last couple of years. Uh, this great interaction between humans and the environment is paramount to the recovery of the quality of the environment we've lost. So uh, also, uh, one cannot deny that climate change is definitely amongst the worst problem we've ever faced. And we might give a quick solution for the problem it causes and how it threatens our lives here in, in, in this world. And this connection between uh, human industrial activities and modern life and climate change is also undisputable. One cannot simply deny that as we see some politicians around the globe wrecking a lot of havoc, havoc in their own communities. Therefore, I understand that this crisis is responsible for pretty much collateral damages in our society, such as the collapse of our economy. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of being really impacted what climate change is doing to our economy and society is already uh, figuring out how uh, bad, dirty investments uh, can uh, be. Uh, I was really happy when one of the panelists uh, just stated that recently UVM has divested its portfolio of investments. So it's positive. I think these kind of actions 
are gonna really uh, inspire other educational institutions across the globe towards the same actions and not only uh, educational institutions but uh, pension funds, uh, the consumer market, the banks, the financial institutions also plays uh, a key hold on that regard. So, uh, and I do think that for every problem uh, we might have possibly in life, there's one immediate solution, which is called education. Because education is a key solution to this and all the problems we might possibly have, as I stated before. Education is gonna shape how the youth people will prepare themselves to mitigate uh, the impacts we are now facing. And I really would like to, to highlight the importance of webinars such as the ones, such as this one, uh, and also would like to uh, state how I value uh, the youth actions I'm seeing across the globe, uh, more specifically in the United States, in the climate litigation case, such as the Juliana case and the ones I know it's undergoing right now in the country. So I do think that this coalition of uh, stakeholders uh, are really important towards uh, fostering a new spirit across our society and inspire good people to take the correct actions. But uh, on the same hand, it's not possible one can do it without a great quality of education and education and in this regard uh, coming from a developed country such as brazil uh, i can definitely assume that this problem here is uh is not uh so uh in a high uh in a high stage of debate such as we are seeing right now in the developing nations but uh on the other hand the country is undergoing a severe and acute environmental crisis. One example I would like to highlight is the deforestation we are, we are definitely seeing right now in the Amazon and how the deforestation is playing a key hold towards uh, the climate crisis in the region and how this climate crisis is threatening people's lives, most likely in the COVID cases the Amazon states uh, underwent. So uh, there's no one, uh, there's no way one can deny uh, the interconnection between climate change and this COVID, in this COVID and other future health problems that uh, we're, we're gonna have to undergo or not if we give the appropriate solution. And we do have all the tools for that technology and also uh, money. That's, that's important. Education is key. Great thoughts. And education is key. And again, I'll repeat what I said earlier, be kind. We have to remember to be kind to each other. And we have to remember to do that while we're educating others. And we have to work together. Uh, Dan, can yeah, you go to the next? Oh yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Oh no, sorry, go ahead. Are you sure? Okay, um, next slide, Dan. We're on to question six. This is our last question, and then we'll be turning to the audience questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please free to put them in the chat, uh, whether you're joining us on Zoom or Facebook Live. Um, and if you are on Zoom, please remember to communicate with all panelists and attendees. Uh, question six, what are the best ways to have these conversations to continue to motivate people to act on climate within this pandemic? Marcelo, you're up. Great, so first of all, uh, a great answer I think for this question is uh, inspiring people. Uh, and how are we gonna inspire people? That's a great question, right? We're gonna, we're gonna inspire people towards the actions that we take in our societies. Uh, so the best way one can have this conversation is definitely by showing folks how we are all integrated to nature. We all belong to the same house. We are all integrated to the same environment. The same uh, climate change issues that we are undergoing in Brazil and the impacts we're facing right now 
is definitely the same. Uh, the populations of Alaska probably might be undergoing at the same time or so in the near future. So environmental conservation is something that requires discipline, action, and a really uh, strong action from our society in terms of uh, choosing the right representatives uh, in the, not only in the elections, but for the organizations itself. So while, although one might not observe how important small actions can make a huge difference, we have to motivate people to better figure out that the more we conserve the environment, the better and the more peaceful, and that's a great point, uh, society will be. So the more we are connected to nature, to nature and the more we're valuing our natural resources, the more we're gonna inspire people, do great actions in our society and develop it, and develop what I think it's the most important thing in all this scenario, which is uh, the fostering and the building of a uh, peaceful civilization. Thanks, Marcelo. Uh, Maya, would you like to go? Um, I want to build off of what Marcelo was saying about being connected to nature and um, showing people how that can impact them because um, as most people are probably familiar with, there's been a uh, like social uprising recently around racism, specifically in America. And um, there was one um, kind of thread of things going around on social media about access to the outdoors and access to nature because outdoor equipment and access to the outdoors is expensive and usually very exclusive to privileged white Americans. And um, it's been that way for a really long time. So I think one thing that can help change that is to make sure that everyone can be connected to nature so everyone can see what the impacts will be and have that personal connection. Yeah. Great points. Uh, Jacob, would you like to add on? I think you might have had a call, so we can move on to questions. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, I can add something onto this question if you want. Um, so one, one I'm thing sorry, that came, you back. okay. Um, so one thing that came to mind when I was listening to Marcelo Mayo talking was that, um, another thing that I've noticed, um, through COVID and maybe a connection to help people feel more inspired, um, is highlighting individual action and just how, how effective that's been for COVID through people choosing to socially distance and wear masks and all that stuff and the power that we've created of protecting our own communities ourselves and kind of using that to inspire people of like individuals can make a difference individuals can make changes and also finding ways to highlight individuals and local groups around the world who are making big impacts um, just on their own i think that is a really powerful tool as well for inspiring people thank you emily would anyone else like to weigh in on the last question before we turn the audience questions? Go ahead, Maria. Okay, so we have a question from Andrew that says, energy systems will change permanently in the world after COVID-19 because of the pandemic exposing vulnerabilities, inefficiencies, inequities, and mendacities of an old energy normal that was finding new ways to kill us with every decade and year. How do you think energy policy will change in the areas you're in and what would you like to see changed? So basically, um, how do you think energy policy is gonna change now and what would you like to see that change? There we go, now I'm unmuted. Okay, um, so one thing that jumped to mind, at least for me, is one thing that I'd like to see change for sure, and I would hope would start changing more quickly after this, um, after we kind of start to come out the other side of this is a um, 
definitely a move towards more renewable energy because that's a direction we're already headed, but especially in the context of air pollution, um, because I think if one thing COVID has highlighted for a lot of people is the, the impact that air pollution has on our health, especially as it's um, considered a risk for greater or more significant um, negative impacts from COVID. Um, and that's especially prevalent in communities that are situated closer to these um, power plants that are that emit a lot of pollution and unfortunately these are often um, communities of color, low income communities. So just further highlighting some of the inequities both in the environment and in the health system as well. So my hope is that maybe these areas will um, be a more direct focus of change after this. Oh, and I personally think that uh, if one can clearly observe the data concerning the, the oil price that has substantially decreased across this uh, COVID crisis we are definitely living right now, uh, it's, it, the, 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 it, it's a question of time. Uh, it's a question of uh, also action as well. Uh, I understand that uh, in the near future, we're not gonna have a society based on fossil fuel energy anymore because although it's not sustainable, uh, the renewable energy uh, seg segment and technologies are gonna actually further deepen our willingness to exchange and improve technology. I know it takes quite a while, but uh, if you guys can see the, how Tesla actions has substantially uh, or better exponentially ramped up uh, the value market uh, in the stock market uh, a couple of e days ago, you can see that uh, people are more uh, reluctant to fossil fuel and more leaning towards renewable because they know uh, the environmental costs associated with uh, the fossil fuels and how this transition can better enhance our quality of life uh, in, the, in the years ahead. So although it's a question of change, it's also a question of cost. And we should think together how we sh can help society to develop more affordable ways of uh, consuming, developing, and also uh, exchanging information on renewables. That's my, that's my point of view. I want to point out, I heard you say uh, you were speaking about Tesla more on the stock side, but I wanted to point out that um, especially in Vermont, transportation is a really big um, source of emissions because almost everyone needs a car because we live so, everyone's living really rurally. And anywhere where there is public transportation, especially during COVID, most people aren't wanting to take it. So I think we need to find new solutions to either more like electric cars or bike commutes or safer ways that people can do public transportation in rural areas and during a pandemic. Um, so I think that's something that really needs to be focused on coming out of this. Great point. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's do a follow up to Andrew's question. Uh, this one is directed to Jacob. Uh, will Australia's policy on the use of coal to generate electricity change as a result of the wildfires and drought conditions in your country? Oh my God, we can only hope, eh? <laughs> so yeah, that's something that we've been advocating for for so long. Um, look, we know that our policies are horrendous when it comes when it comes to coal. The fact that, like, the, the Liberal government still pushes it, um, it claims that there's going to be a massive economic losses if we don't. Um, when if you look at the broad scheme of things, there's going to be more economic losses due to climate change, due to due to health, than what there is using using coal. Um, and, and and coal, the coal industry in Australia is basically a it's, it, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's the biggest, um, you know, contributor in Australia to, to greenhouse emissions. Um, and, and the fact that we still continue to push it um, is, is quite absurd, to be honest. I mean, I'm not sure if you've heard of the Adani coal mine, um, but basically there's, there's this amazing reef in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, and Mariah actually um, helped do some work on it. 
but um, there's been there's been coral bleaching in the last sort of ten years, um, which has been directly due to to climate change, um, and this this new this big huge massive coal mine that's just been instated um, by an Indian investor is literally about I think it's fifty kilometers uh, inland to the reef. Um, and we, as, as Marcelo was talking about, there's, there's obviously direct impacts that, that, um, these mining sites have on the, on the surrounding areas. Um, and so this Great Barrier Reef that supports so much biodiversity and so much life and that the local indigenous people, you know, have as, have as this foundation to their story, um, is basically gonna just get ruined. So it's something that at AYCC, um, which I volunteer for and at C, we, we are pushing for is, is better climate policies in, in relation to coal. Um, but look, we, we can only, we can only hope, we can only hope, but we're really not sure at this point. Yeah, sorry. So, sorry, sorry uh, for getting so passionate about that, that, that question, but yeah. Oh, that's a great thing. <laughs> Um, Raya, do you want to go ahead? Sure. So the next question is from Andrew. Um, it says, an article published in Nature states that global emissions are estimated to have fallen 17% during the period in which governments around the world impose lockdowns. A majority of this is attributed to the transportation sector. Will working from home or teleworking be a lifestyle change that climate activists support more heavily in the future? I feel like Maya, you, you're interested in the, the transport part of Vermont. You may want to speak to that one. Um, I would say there are benefits to the working at home, as we've seen. Um, I guess a positive side of lockdowns has been it's kind of like a trial run to see how would that impact the economy in some ways if more people were to work from home. Um, and we've certainly seen um, as that person, Andrew, I think it was, pointed out in their question that 17% um, of emissions went down because people weren't going to work and transport, transportation overall. Um, but also, I think we've also seen that uh, people can't be together and that has negative impacts on the work that's being done, the relationships that are happening and change that can be made. Um, so I would say, I guess my view on that is, I think we should shift to some more remote models for things to reduce people going to work when possible, but also I think we need to focus on other options for transportation that keep people together, but um, don't harm the climate in doing so. Anyone have anything to add? Yeah. yeah, I just, I mostly, I just want to say that I think that was a good point. I mean, because as someone who's been working from home for the last, uh, how many months has it been now? Like six months. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of great things about it, but it is challenging not to be able to be in the same space with your coworkers, to not just be able to walk down the hall. If you have a question, um, there are a lot of great tools out there on the internet that make it easier, but um it definitely feels more isolating. However, I think I think some of that too is just a factor of having to socially distance. And I would like to think that in the future we could work remotely while still being able to be in community in person as well. Um, so I, I personally would like to see working remotely play a larger role, but I don't know if it's feasible I don't know what percentage of, of the workforce it would be feasible for. So I, I agree with Maya that it's a balance between pushing working from home more, but then also finding more sustainable ways for people to um, get to their jobs or having people work from home a couple days a week, have people go into the office a couple of days a week, having more satellite offices. So instead of someone driving like two hours to get to work, they're able to work at a location with other people who are working, who are from the same area, so they don't have to go as far to be able to collaborate. Um, so I think there are a lot of solutions, but I think working from home is definitely a, an important part of it. Uh, can I just add to that, um, if possible? Um, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think in the in the IT and management sectors, it's definitely something which perhaps you know, look to push for uh, and make a slow progression towards. But I think in the sectors of health and, and, and social work and community development, 
it might be a little bit hard because I think a lot of that work, you know, given that I'm sort of in it, it, it does rely on that on those interpersonal connections that you you know that you that you gain with people, and and that often comes with being in their space and and, and doing things together and, and and having organic conversations that aren't um, you know forced up by a screen. So um, I think that it's definitely something that in in future climate activists you know like myself can can maybe start to push for maybe on maybe a minor level um but it's 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 definitely a great idea and i mean you know nature's pretty reliable and if, if they're saying that um emissions have fallen 17 percent then you know that's great we should take those you know take those words so Yeah, and I just wanted to make one more little addition on this question. Um, I think that going into the future, what I'm hoping we see is a lot more flexibility. There was this very rigid kind of nine to five structure in place. And now that that's been kind of torn up, I think that I, I agree that that's definitely not a permanent solution. There are people that are just going to need to go back to work, want to go back to work, be more productive going back to work whatever those reasons would be. I do think that there's also a subset of people or a proportion that wouldn't need to be there every day. I think that that's been brought up by a bunch of you guys over this time period. That what I kind of hope for, it maybe isn't necessarily that people fully move to telework, but that there are opportunities open for people not coming into the office every day. If there's work that you could be doing at home that you can do it at home, that we have that flexibility in the workplace to allow for positive change, both for the workplace itself and if that has impacts on people traveling and the footprint that that leaves, that's absolutely fantastic and kind of naturally integrates into a life in an interesting way. So. Well, and basically on this matter, I think that uh, people are going to have to find solutions for both the employers and also uh, the employees, because it turns out that there are great advantages associated to this pr new practice we're going to have to undergo. And also uh, there are disadvantages as well. So I just could see a report later that, that folks were complaining and the costs associated within working from home, such as the increase of energy and also other costs associated to whatever activities they were doing towards like printing stuff, developing things that they were supposed to be doing at their offices. So I think we should counterbalance that. And I'm pretty sure uh, we're gonna have to find solutions. On the other hand, I understand as well that uh, this new reality is gonna actually shift the practice towards building fancy and very uh, elegant and huge office I think that the employers uh, are going to rethink how they're going to invest their money towards creating more jobs effectively and also saving some money and uh, building more functional and more modest facilities to develop their activities. That, that, those are my thoughts on that. I want to say... From the sorry, from the perspective of someone who's still in public school, um, 26 million students ride the school bus every day in normal times, and um, a very, very, very small portion of those are electric or renewable. Um, and I think that's something that school, as we've seen, is such a moving for this fall. No one knows what's going to happen in different parts of the country, and um, in the world and but a lot of people have stressed that education is something that needs to be done in person so i think if we're going to be redesigning what education looks like when we go back to in-person learning we should redesign what the transportation for education looks like because it's it my district has to um it's a really large district so we run buses for over an hour to get students to school and there are multiple buses they emit a lot of carbon and it's something that a lot of people don't think about because it's essential but there are other alternatives i think does anyone else want to add i can turn to the next question otherwise next is a follow-up to andrew's question uh, is working from home an option available to everyone? Rural Vermont, Brazilian favelas, the Australian outback, and Bush? If not, 
Should we do more to ensure that teleworking is an option? Well, I can speak to the Volvo Vermont portion of this, at least. I do think this is definitely a weakness of our current technology infrastructure that has come up that, a lot, at least in America, a very large portion of people are connected. That does not necessarily mean you have the connection that you need to do telework or, in my case, um, to attend classes. Um, I considered spending my time at my family's home in Vermont, um, and I will fully acknowledge that that makes me sound extremely privileged and I will take that with the grain of salt that it is. Um, but one of the reasons I knew I could not do that was there was just not access to high quality internet connection out there. And I was not going to be able to attend my classes or work my job that required me to be able to talk to people in real time from that. Um, so I think that if this is going to be an option that's going to continue at least into the foreseeable future, we really need to be thinking about how we're going to create the infrastructure to support that in all different places um, and kind of to tie that also back into some of the more environmental portions of this as well of what does that look like what do, does that development come with a cost if we start rushing to try to implement like this high-speed internet infrastructure and what does that mean um, so it's just something to chew on. I am not necessarily super well versed in it, but it is something that kind of worries me when I think about a jump into this new level of development. Yeah, and something that came to mind for me is someone who's been doing a lot of um, online workshops, um, leading them for the last couple months, um, is that even if people have access to good internet connections, they have access to all the right platforms, um, not everyone is well versed in how to use these platforms and that can um, definitely pose a challenge. I know um, there have been different people I've interacted with um, through workshops and other avenues of what I do, um, where using these platforms is unfamiliar and it can be a challenge and it's, you know, it's totally something that people are able to learn regardless of their age or their familiarity with the computers, the internet, all that stuff. Um, but it can take time for some people to feel comfortable and confident enough with these platforms to be able to work as effectively as they might be able to otherwise. Um, so I feel like something that we need as well is some kind of training program, whether it's um, if, a, if a workplace decides they want to go fully remote, whether that's checking in with their employees and making sure that everyone feels comfortable with using Zoom or Slack or whatever it is they're using to get their work done every day. Um, and if they don't feel comfortable setting them up with resources or um, someone else at their workplace that they can go to to ask for questions. Because I know also, um, at least, uh, definitely for myself, if there's something that I don't feel very comfortable doing, I uh, don't feel like I know a whole lot about, but I feel like everyone else around me is totally um, savvy with it, I might not ask for help. Um, and so just making sure that people are getting the help they need, even if they're not directly asking for it. Yeah. I'd, um, I'd just like to touch on the, on some of the first points you made there. Um, as, as a, you know, as a social worker and as an indigenous youth worker, um, I'm, I'm a program manager. And so basically I work with young indigenous people who have been involved with the youth justice system. Um, and, you know, we aim to provide them support and, and, and cultural connection um to sort of further empower them now um the pro the, so the program for me has been very difficult to run because we obviously can't do that interpersonal group stuff and it's all had to go online and unfortunately for a lot of my clients a lot of them are from such bad backgrounds that they don't even have access to the internet and so i you know we haven't been able to work as normal like i haven't been able to provide them um, with the therapeutic support as per normal um, because they can't get online um, and it's, it just makes things so much harder to, um, you know, to, to navigate because there, there's all these objectives that you, that, you know, as a worker, you, you have to, uh, sorry, as an employee, you have to, you have to meet. Um, but there's, you know, there's two, it's, you know, it takes two to tango, so to speak. And, and the clients on the receiving end of, of, of the therapy and the ones who need, um, who, who need my services, can't actually get them and they can't leave their house to go to a library to get them either. And so it sort of leaves us uh, all in this really difficult spot where I'm not actually doing what I'm, I'm not actually doing much of my job because I, I, I can't. And 
my clients aren't receiving the help that they need to, um, you know, to further develop. So it just makes things very, very shaky. Um, and it, it's a hard space to navigate um, as a social worker. Um, and to answer your question about the, the Australian outback, yeah, the Australian outback is, oh, sorry. Yeah, Andrew, your question about the Australian outback. Yeah, the Australian outback is very harsh. If you get about 45 minutes out of the city, you don't have reception. So, difficult. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay, we'll move I, on. But, yep. I just would like to say that there is no silver bullet for this question, although it's a very interesting one. I think every society, every community, every uh, country in the specific part are gonna have to face their own challenges and try to find solutions for that. Concerning the Brazilian favelas, I understand that uh, uh, most likely they're gonna have to adapt as well and uh, technology is gonna play a key role on uh, helping people towards finding solutions for uh, these situations. But there are some kind of activities that doesn't allow people to work remotely I understand that six months ago, no one here in this panel would imagine we could do such an interesting meeting uh, with this global perspectives uh, within uh, within this, this this time frame. So uh, this is very new for everyone. However, it turns out that, uh, as I said, there are great things that uh, are associated with that, but. Uh, of course, uh, there are great activities that uh, one should be mandatorily in their work post or work office. So uh, it depends, it varies. That's my impression. Okay, we'll move on to the last question from Jasper Barnes. What are some good ways to stave off climate anxiety? It's obviously important to care about and act upon it, but sometimes it can be a bit much relatable. Anyone want to pop in? Um, yeah, okay, so I'll just sort of touch on this. Um, basically, we're all going through that, hey, uh, that climate anxiety, and it sucks. It sucks real bad. But I think in times like these, it's sort of important to recognize what we do have. Um, in comparison to, to, you know, to what we soon won't have. Um, I think that times like these allow you to reflect on your communities and, and the people that support you to keep fighting for justice. And I think it's super important to keep leaning on them, um, you know, for that support and, 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 and for that um, almost, you know, the, the, that friend therapy, if you will, because I think um, having those supports through your communities allows you to continue to push for change. Um, and for a lot of us, you know, a lot of us, you know, who grew up in the environment, who, who grew up doing a lot of outdoor activities, it's very hard to see a light at the end of the tunnel because we've, you know, we've established our, you know, almost our being on, 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 on our passions. Um, and so I, I, I would say that, um, you know, to continue to lean on your friends, especially those who are, who, who are of the same beliefs as you, um, and continue to just expand your networks and, and, and find other people who, who, who share the same beliefs because it just it, it just allows you to build your um, you know a, a, a strong foundation of people around you who can support you through these times when things are bad and it also allow you to celebrate when you know when things are going good and when you have made progress so that would be my advice yeah that, that's I mean that's great and I just want to add on to that um, something else as well that I feel like I've been thinking about more is trying to keep track of small actionable steps you can take, whether it's um, you're gonna sit down and read this book or watch this video clip or um, set up a home composting system or try to bike one day a week. Just, I think I definitely, I, I feel the climate anxiety. It's, it's really challenging at times. Um, and I feel like it gets even worse when you're looking at it as there's this huge problem and we got to try to solve it and I've got to try to do as much of it as I can because I don't know, um, I don't know how much is actually going to be able to get done, but I think trying to break it up into smaller chunks and think about it in 
you know, if I take these little steps once a week, every once in a while, you know, it might be a year out, two years out, but I might look back and say, wow, like I've made my life so much more sustainable. And it wasn't just this overnight shift of sold my car, um, or start biking everywhere just right away. Um, and while it would be great if we could all do that, it's, it's overwhelming. And so I think picking, picking things to start with and kind of working, working your way along um, is helpful as well, just trying to take it in smaller pieces. I just wanted to add one more little thing too to what both of you guys said is that one thing I try to do is keep in mind why I'm so passionate about the work that I'm doing to begin with. Um, for me, and this is one of the reasons I'm here, I'm a huge bird nerd and I try and get out even if it's just been in my backyard if I can't go anywhere else and get out and hear birds singing and see them and appreciate like a little moment that you have where you know one looks at you and you look back at it or you hear a hermit thrush singing out in the woods somewhere and appreciate those for what they are, get the joy out of that and that just helps keep me going when I'm feeling down on it to know that that's what I'm doing it for. And that because I do that, someone else 20 years down the line might have the chance to do that too. Um, and it's really small, but it keeps me going. So I hope that's helpful. That is so perfect. <laughs> I agree. We understand both. Both. I do the same, Kaylee. I just love it. Does anyone else have anything they want to add? Okay, well, wrapping up, uh, we really encourage everyone to keep sharing stories on this topic and building from the perspectives that were offered here. Um, we hope that you got the sense of the power of storytelling and climate action and on the intersections of the health crisis and the climate crisis. Um, this is absolutely an ongoing conversation. We want to make sure you all have access to the sources that we use tonight, as well as some mental health resources. So I'm gonna post a follow-up resources link in the chat for everyone, and we'll email it out later as well. So we hope you stay strong during these times. I know that they're challenging, and we hope that you don't lose that fire in your belly to keep building a better community. Uh, we look forward to you all joining us for upcoming Tough Conversations webinars and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. So thank you and good night.